Hello Mount Sinai. Hello to everybody that chose to join us today. We're so happy you decided to uh, be a part of our study. We are studying the Articles of Faith and we're on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. Our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32 and the truth will set you free. And so we will continue our third declaration of freedom. Freedom from discouragement, no frustration. And that's found in Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 18 through 30. Today, I'll read verses 23 through 25 out of the NIV. Verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is, not, is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not have, yet have, we wait for it patiently. So Paul, in the entirety of our verses, speaks of the reality of suffering. And with suffering comes groans. But, he says, that they are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. We are promised a better place, and suffering keeps us reminded that this world is not our home. We've said that when the first man, Adam, sinned, his disobedience brought suffering for all creation. But because of God's love for us, he promised that it wouldn't be so always. And Paul reminds us in verse 18 that our current sufferings are not worth being compared to the glory that will be revealed. Every time I read that verse, I really have to pause and just meditate on it for a while. When I think of the sufferings that are part of this world, the sufferings that believers have gone through, the suffering that come with just being human, Sometimes, in fact, lots of times, it's as a result of my own sin. But sometimes, it's a result of just being a part of the human race. Suffering is real. Most times when we think of suffering, we think of sicknesses. But sickness is not the only thing that causes us to suffer. We can be in perfect health, with money in the bank, and have youth on our side, and yet suffer. We are either in it, just left it, or on our way to it. We can't be in this life and miss it. Suffering does not discriminate. It knows exactly how to find us. And what I find amazing is not that we suffer, but that Paul says the future glory will be worth the agony. It will be worth all the suffering that we're going through. That's like getting uh, an old-fashioned whooping and your daddy tells you, I'm doing it because I love you. I don't know about you, but my response to that is, of course, in my mind, it, it was, how about loving me just a little less? It wasn't until I became an adult that I was able to appreciate all the pain that I endured during those love sessions. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 and 18, the NIV says, For our light and momentary troubles 
are achieving for us a, an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul says that we are to get the right perspective on suffering. We're not to ignore it. In fact, we can't ignore it. We acknowledge it, but don't let it block your view. Our view is on eternity. On the scale of life, when we put our present trials on one side and our future glory on the other, our future glory far outweighs the trials that we're going through. Our trials are actually working for us. Even though we are sinners by nature, there are some things we don't do because of trials or expected sufferings. Paul said that all of creation groans and waits in eager expectation to see what God has for us. Why? Because even though creation didn't do anything, it too suffers because of man's disobedience. And so creation wants to be set free. It wants to be all that God created it to be. It wants to be made new. Then Paul says that believers also groan. As believers, we groan different and for different reasons than non-believers. We have trials and tribulations, but we also have the Holy Spirit. We have a, a foretaste of what's to come. We know that it's going to be even better than we can imagine. My youngest grandson loves it when his dad tells him that they're going on an adventure. So much so that when his dad tells him, let's go, he doesn't do the, where are we going? Or are we there yet? He doesn't do any of that. He just waits in eager expectation. Why? because he's already experienced some of what that means. Each adventure is better than the previous one, making it hard for his little mind to even imagine what his father has in store for him. As believers, it's like that for us. We groan because we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us. When we believe in him, when we believe in and trust the salvific work of Jesus on the cross, the Holy Spirit immediately comes and dwells in us. He is the first deposit that God makes to show us that we belong to him. He is the earnest money that's put down to show that you're all in on the purchase. The Holy Spirit is the guarantor that makes all of God's promises to us real. That's major. He comes in and quenches our thirst and satisfies our hunger. It's as though we've been walking in physical darkness and then the light comes on. You know something has happened, even though you can't explain it. Then we also experience the joy of the Lord that, bur that bursts from forth from within us. You, you know that you are different and, and the exciting adventure called life is about to start. You feel like you're starting life all over again. All of this happens on the inside. You're brand new, yet nothing on the outside has changed. And, and thus we groan. When you have tasted better, accepting less is not easy. Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 13 and 14, in the easy to read version says, you heard the true message, the good news about your salvation. When you heard that good news, you believed in Christ. And in Christ, God put his special mark on you by giving you the Holy Spirit that he promised. The Spirit is the first payment that guarantees we will all 
we will get all that God has for us. Then we will enjoy complete freedom as people who belong to him. The goal for all of us is, to pray, is the praise of God in all of his glory. So we groan because we long for all that God has for us. Romans 8 and 23 says, We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Thus far, creation waits eagerly, and now the believer also waits eagerly for what God has promised. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. As believers, we are being renewed daily on the inside, but our bodies are decaying on the outside. God has not changed our physical body. No matter what we do to maintain these bodies, they still grow old. They still have aches. They still have pains. Even though we are sons of God, it does not yet show. I read that when the Romans adopted a child, they could do so privately and no one was aware of it. But then a second adoption took place. And at this adoption, the child was brought forth before the authorities and its old garments was taken off and the father would put on new, on new garments suitable for his new life. Paul says, Now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when, we, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. God will dress us all as he has dressed his eldest son. Right now, our freedom is incomplete. Even though our spirit have the freedom to soar in the heavenly realms, the heavenly places with Christ, our bodies can only roam up about the earth and deal with the suffering and decay that the earth offers. Right now, our glory is not yet revealed. We know that the battle has been won. But the parade hasn't taken place. Even though we groan, it's not the groan of death. It's the groan of life. I'll end with a story that explains it beautifully. At least I thought so. It says, the other night, two men working very late were groaning in two very different ways. One of them saying, oh, there is a poor Christmas day in store for me. He had been a drunkard and wasted his money. Now his fellow workman also groaned. On being asked why, he said, I want to get home to my dear wife and children. I have such a happy house. I do not like being out of it. So Christians have a good father, a blessed home, and groan to get to it. And there is more joy in the groans of a Christian than in all the laughter of the ungodly. Well, that's all for today. Join us next week as we continue our study, Freedom from Discouragement. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we say thank you. Thank you for letting us know that our groans should be life and not death. Father, we thank you for what our ears have heard, and we ask that you would show us what to do with what we've heard and give us the courage to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.